the generations are compacted together in the last chapter of Genesis. Jacob and Joseph, his son, die in the same chapter. Um, we have the recording of, of the death of Jacob or, or Israel at the beginning of Genesis 50. It says that Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and, and kissed him. He actually, um, his death is recorded in the last verse of chapter 49. Joseph's mourning begins in, in the beginning of, of chapter 15. It said that the Egyptians mourned for him 70 days. This is how important Joseph was that when his Canaanite father died, the Egyptians wept for him for over two months. Two months and ten days. And when the day of mourning was, was passed, Joseph asked Pharaoh's permission to bury his father in his homeland. And so they all go back to Canaan to bury Jacob. And... Uh, they bury him there and um, at the place of uh, Machpelah. And uh, it says in verse 14 that after, it's actually the place that Abraham had bought to bury Sarah in. This is in Hebron, just south of Jerusalem, um, modern day Hebron. And um, so after they bury their father, they return to Egypt, verse 14. Now, there's one great spiritual lesson left in the book. Remember when Esau says to Jacob, after our father dies, I'm going to kill you. That's the reason that Jacob left Canaan in Genesis 28. After our father dies, I'm going to kill you. Um, and so, um, now, the, now this father's dead, Jacob is dead, and the brothers were pretty confident that if Joseph ever took revenge on them, he wouldn't take revenge while Jacob was alive because it would break Jacob's heart. But now Jacob's dead, and they begin to wonder, and their guilt comes back and they're afraid, will Joseph now kill us? Will he take vengeance on us now that our father is dead? They say to each other in verse 15, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong we have done him? So they send a message to Joseph. Your father charged before he died saying, thus you shall say to Joseph. I don't know if this is true, this may be a lie. Please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. They didn't understand. They didn't understand Joseph's character. They didn't understand grace. They didn't understand forgiveness. What happens in the first generation of men born in Genesis? which is also the first generation of men born. Well, a brother kills a brother. Cain kills Abel. What happens in the last generation in the book of Genesis? The brothers are afraid that their brother will kill him. Adam and Eve fell, their children were fallen, and so what happens? They kill each other. They need redemption. Joseph's brothers had been redeemed, but they still didn't understand the character of redemption. They still didn't understand what redemption meant. They still didn't understand the character of pure grace, of a mercy which could really forgive, and it's over. It's forever forgiven. This. Um, this situation leads Joseph to say something magnificent. It's really one of the great spiritual things said in the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 50, verse 19. Joseph says, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? By the way, did you know that the command, Do not be afraid, is the most repeated commandment in the Bible? Do not fear. 
do not be afraid. Joseph says, do not be afraid. Am I God? Am I the one who has the right to bring vengeance? Joseph's power never went to his head. It never made him proud. It never made him arrogant. Joseph was never confused about who the true authority was, about who the true source of truth and power was. Joseph never got himself mixed up with God. That's, a, that's hard for a ruler to do. That's hard for a leader to do, to make sure that you never confuse yourself with God. Um, Here's the great verse, verse 20. In the New Testament, we have a great, great verse about God's sovereignty. It's Romans 8, 28. Very, very early in the, the life of an, an American Christian, at least, we are taught about Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28 says, God causes all all things to work together for good for those who love God and for those who are called according to His purpose. What does that mean? It means that some things are bad things. But God, for the person who knows God savingly, for the person who knows Jesus, God has the power to take a bad thing and cause it to work together to become something good. That's what Romans 8.28 says. Genesis 50.20 is the Romans 8.28 of the Old Testament. Genesis 50 verse 20 is Romans 8.28 applied specifically to the life of Joseph to the situation that Joseph found himself in. What does he say in Genesis 50, 20? He says, you meant to do something bad to me. But when you tried to do something bad to me, God took that bad thing and caused it to become something good for me. How did God put Joseph up on a throne? by allowing his brothers to throw him down in a pit. How does Jesus make, make blind eyes to see? Well, sometimes he takes mud and rubs it in their eyes. That's a funny way to give somebody sight back, isn't it? You wouldn't think to make a blind man see that you would rub mud in his eye. How does Elijah burn the altar up, 1 Kings 18. He pours water on it. If you're going to set something on fire, you don't want to pour water on it. What's the point? The point is this is not happening naturally. This is not happening as a coincidence. God is ruling. God is overruling. God is overruling nature. God can burn wet wood. God can make blind eyes see by rubbing mud in the eye. God is overruling the wickedness of men. God takes the effort of Joseph's brothers to put him down by bringing him up. They try to kill him. How does God put Joseph in a place where he saves the life of his brothers? by putting the brothers in a place where they try to take the life of Joseph. You see how God's sovereignty works. God takes the opposite of what we try to do in our sin, and He does something wonderful in His righteousness. Joseph understood that. Joseph knew God. Joseph knew the character of God. Joseph knew how God worked. Joseph knew that God had orchestrated everything. Not just everything in Joseph's life, but everything in their lives. Not just everything in their lives, but everything in the whole world. God made the world in Genesis 1. God controls the world in Genesis 50. 
from beginning to end, God is sovereign. God is in control. God doesn't make the world and go away. God is in control of the world that He made. God meant it for good in order to bring this present result to preserve many people alive. God did this so that you could be saved. God used your wickedness to save you. Now, how does this work theologically? It works like this. What is the worst thing that has ever happened in the history of the world? That's easy. The murder of the Son of God. Death by slow torture. The cross. God's Son was born on this planet. He did good. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He brought comfort. He told the truth. We killed Him. We killed Him. What's the worst thing that ever happened in the history of the world? The murder of the Son of God. What's the best thing that ever happened in the history of the world? Christ died for me. Christ died from my sins. Christ died to save me from my sins. It's the same thing. The worst thing has become the best thing. How did that happen? God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. We meant it for evil that He might be killed. God meant it for good that we might be saved. You see how great this gospel is? You see how great this grace is? You see how grace this, great this sovereignty is? You see how great this God is? You see how God works? And by the end of Genesis, there's a man who understands God. He understands God because he is like Christ. Christ came to show us what God is like. That man is the subject of Genesis 37 through 50. That man's name is Joseph. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com. So, he says, don't be afraid. I'm going to take care of you. So he comforted them and he spoke kindly to them. Now beginning in verse 22, we have recorded the death of Joseph. And Joseph died at the uh, age of 110. And he says in verse 24, I'm about to die, but God's going to take care of you. You don't need me to take care of you because God is going to take care of you. And uh, don't bury me here. But I want to be buried ultimately in the land of my fathers. Um, the last verse of Genesis says, So Joseph died at the age of 110 years, and his body was preserved. His body was embalmed and he was placed in a coffin in Egypt." Now Moses was writing those words to the people who took Joseph's body out of Egypt in that same coffin three centuries later. So ends the first book of the Bible. So ends the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings. 
the book which in the first 11 chapters tells us of the great events, and the book which in chapters 12 through 50 tells us of the great family, the family who will bless the world, the family whose son will save the world, great Jacob's greater son, the one who is like Joseph, the one who's named Jesus.